All right, my name is Els Campbell, and I'm a computational biologist in the laboratory branch of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. I mean, I'm going to describe Microbe Trace, which is a portable and secure tool um, that we use to compare genomic and epidemiologic networks that are collected during outbreak investigations. So what is Microbe Trace? Microbe Trace is a tool that's designed for, uh, to enable uh, a robust network analysis that uh, includes both sequence and contact tracing data um, that arise from outbreak investigations and surveillance. Um, and it's a very robust data integration platform that allows uh, visualization of very complex um, data elements that you typically can't visualize in an environment like Excel. Um, and it's very pathogen agnostic, so we're, we're not um, tied to HIV, although that's where we've started. We've, we work with um, hepatitis C, tuberculosis, and a lot of other pathogens um, that, uh, where contact tracing networks are typically collected. But ultimately, we want to take uh, standard Excel data sheets that we typically work with and turn those into um, complex and interactive network visuals. And so the two types of data sets that we commonly work with are um, uh, line lists, or just lists of individuals where each person represents a line. And so here, uh, towards the bottom of, of this slide, we have an example of a line list. Uh, so individual one is ID 1807. We have some information about that individual. You go to the next line, and it's another individual. And this is the most common type of data that we work with in public health. But in addition to that, we'll also collect contact tracing data or partner services data that are collected during an outbreak. And this re is represented in the format of uh, the case is, uh, has a contact um, and there's some type of contact between them like sex or sex and injection drug use. Um, and so this is represented um, as person A is connected to person B by some type of contact. So Microbe Trace is meant to visualize these data sets. And we typically work with Google Chrome, although it does work um, in other common browsers like uh, Mozilla Firefox. Um, but ultimately, it is delivered to your browser securely. Um, you navigate to a website. It downloads the entire application to your computer. Um, and then you can actually switch off from the internet and disconnect, and it will still continue to function as normal. Um, the goal here is really to, to prove to you that your internet is staying local on your computer and not being shipped out over the internet. Um, <clears throat> we, as we've mentioned, we work with very um, common file formats like Excel in either CSV or XLSX formats. Um, sequence data are, are most commonly um, in the FASTA uh, sequence format, which is just A's, T's, G's, and C's. Um, and then we also take a variety of different formats like distance matrices, and more recently we take a phylogenetic tree in the NUIC format. Uh, we also boast a few other uh, functionalities like being able to save your workspace where you left off. Um, and then uh, optionally you can turn on a setting that will enable you to um, auto-save uh, every minute in the background as you're continuing to work. So I'm going to start with some design decisions um, that have really helped to guide Microbe Trace over the last couple of years. First and foremost, interaction and feedback with end users like yourself um, are, has really been what's driven um, development of Microbe Trace. Uh, local health department users um, our primary users and have really come up with a lot of the feature requests that, that we'll be demonstrating today. Um, so the, the first most important thing um, that we set out to, begin, uh, to develop this program to begin with was uh, we wanted the tool to be delivered to your uh, web browser, to the user via the web browser. <coughs> Uh, and that this is preferable to actually downloading and installing an executable file like you would a normal program. And the reason for that is that you don't need administrator privileges. So you can work on a computer that you may not have um, full access to, install um, Google Chrome, and then be able to uh, visualize your data sets without having to 
file some additional request with an IT group. Um, probably most importantly is that there is an overwhelming stigma associated with data surrounding HIV, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis, um, especially when it comes to partner services data that are collected during an outbreak investigation. And because of this overwhelming stigma, we know that these data want to be held locally, that they, uh, state and local health departments um, are under pressures both legally and for privacy reasons just to keep these data um, to um, be accessible to as minimum amount of people as possible. Um, <clears throat> many of the computers that access these data, especially surveillance data, are um, connected to um, only the, net, the public health network. And so what this means is the, the computer is air-gapped from the, the network or disconnected. And so we needed uh, individual computers to be able to download the program and uh, be disconnected from the outside internet afterwards so that you could um, uh, install the tool and, and not have any risk of the internet uh, being connected to the machine or have any risk of the data uh, exiting the network. And then finally, contact networks, demographic data, and sequence data um, are very different, dif uh, uh, different data types that are very difficult to integrate and work with. Um, and they often come in various formats and from various sources. So we wanted uh, state and local health users to be able to um, accept as many arbitrary file types and numbers of files as possible. So oftentimes when you work with a, a sequencing laboratory, it might be the state sequencing laboratory, a commercial health la or a commercial sequencing laboratory, as well as um, uh, the CDC. And so we want you to be able to take in all those different file types, not have to worry about integrating them yourself, and just drop them into the program and have those visualized. So we're going to start by first navigating to Microbe Trace to show how uh, we load files into uh, Microbe Trace to visualize them. So first we're going to open a normal browser. As we've indicated, you can use uh, Firefox, but, but we've um, developed it for Chrome and are most comfortable advising um, users to use Chrome. So um, the first thing that we'll do is navigate to the URL. Uh, there's two ways to get here, um, but ultimately the direct address is microbetrace.cdc.gov. When you navigate to that page, you'll be uh, greeted with a license agreement that basically um, it, uh, says use at your own risk um, and use the tool as is, um, and you accept those terms and you're um, allowed to then layer on the data that you have um, collected. So we'll click Add Files in the bottom left corner, and um, we'll be prompted with a normal um, Add File prompt. And so I'm going to add the two file types that we went through briefly um, during the introduction, which is a node list and an, uh, and an edge list, or the list of individuals that are in the data set, um, and we'll call that a node list. You can see I've selected the node button here off to the right. Um, for each file, you'll need to indicate where the IDs are that are relevant to that file type. So for a node list, we really only need to know what the actual unique ID is for each individual. Um, it doesn't need to be called ID. Many times it's got some other name instead of an ID, and so we wanted to be able to support the ability to just pick from a dropdown which ID was most relevant. Um, so here it's called ID, and I'm just going to select that. For the edge list, or the list of contacts between persons, we need to tell it who person A is and who person B is, or um, in, in the uh, terminology of, of network science, that's the source is person A and the target is person B. And we don't pay any um, reference to the fact that it's a source or target of infection. These are just terms that are used in network science to indicate who is person A and who is person B when they're connected by a line. 
So here um, I've told it ID A is the source, ID B is the target. And then if you have some metric indicating distance between those two individuals, you can select it here. In this case, because we're only um, showing a link between person A and person B, we don't actually have a distance. Um, and so we'll say none and then hit launch. So we've loaded two file types. And again, I want to be clear um, that we're loading files. We're not uploading files. So the files stay exactly where they were on your computer when you first connected them. Um, and so there's really no movement of anything by using uh, microbe trays. So what you see on screen is uh, the network that is rendered from the data set that we just uploaded. Each circle represents a person, and each line represents uh, a connection that was reported between those persons. Now, what this is is a physics simulation. So when I zoom in, you can see that each little circle has the ability to kind of repel other circles on screen and kind of push them away. The whole purpose here is just to lay out the network with the minimum number of crossing lines possible so that we can create a visual that is, is most informative. Um, and so you can drag nodes around on screen and position them. But ultimately, the goal here is to just get everything visualized all in one place. Um, <clears throat> the important thing is, because we have layered on, in addition to just the network, all of the other information about the individual, we can connect up other information. And so the, the simple example is from this pullout menu in the gear in the top left corner we get a first menu of uh, how we'd like to color all of the nodes, um, and, or how we'd like to style color, not just color, a lot of different um, capabilities here. So first, I'm going to map label to ID. And you can immediately see it updates the image um, with an ID. And you can change or, or um, manipulate that label size or the label positioning um, it, to best meet your needs. Um, you can also map other things to the hover icon. So when I hover over this, you can see that it will pop up with um, the ID because it defaults to ID. But we can map that to another uh, visual uh, uh, data point as well. Um, and so we'll map it to age. And now when I hover over each individual, you can see that it pops up with an age. Um, <clears throat> these are kind of the high level labels. We can also sh uh, switch to shape and sizes. Uh, one, we calculate the number of neighbors automatically in the network. So um, what you can do is size by degree. This is a, a, a variable that's going to be included in any data set that you upload because we will calculate the degree. Degree, just with source, as with source and target, is kind of a commonly used term in network science that indicates how many neighbors a person has in the network. So what we can do is size by degree. You can see everything has readjusted. There's not much visual difference. And so what we can do is scale that up and drag this slider bar. And now we see that the ones, the individuals that have the most uh, number of neighbors are also uh, most visually apparent on screen. Um, we can also map shapes. For example, if we wanted to uh, map shape to city, I guess they're all in Atlanta in this dummy data set. So we can map them to a risk factor. Um, and it automatically pops up with a key in the top right corner of what that, um, that visual styling parameter um, is relevant to. So we can remap things here. It doesn't, you don't have to pick what it's defaulted to as part of the, um, as part of the visual. So you can say, instead of sir, uh, plus signs, let's make them diamonds. Instead of diamonds, we can make it a square. And instead of squares here, we'll make it an X. Um, in addition to that, you can actually manipulate um, the key as well. So if your data just says het, but you actually mean heterosexual, 
you can actually type that out. Um, or instead of IDU, you might want to say person who injects drugs. And you can do this so that you can dynamically create the key for the visual that you'd like to, to um, produce. So men have sex with men. And it automatically kind of adjusts the size, et cetera. Um, we can also do the same thing with colors. So here I'm going to color nodes um, by, um, I guess we could do zip code. Um, we have a few different zip codes in the data set. And so um, it automatically pops up with what that zip code is, is colored as in the top right in the key. But you can remap some of these. So I'll color one of them as black. And you can see that this group over here is primarily in one zip code. And so that is the most of the visuals. There's one other thing that we can color by, which is uh, we can color the links by the type of contact that was reported. Um, and so we can extend this key. Oops, that was number of contacts. I meant to go by type. And so here, again, we can choose the particular color that we want. Let's make that a darker blue. And we could make one darker red. Um, to create uh, a visual that really has as much information layered uh, on it as possible. I really wouldn't recommend layering on this much information. It's a bit too much color and a bit too much um, shape. But it is a, a good demonstration of what um, we can achieve in terms of customizing a particular visual. All right, so what I have created here is quite a busy visual. Uh, with lots of different colors and lots of different um, layers on top. So we're going to uh, remove some of those just to make it a little bit less busy. Um, so we'll get rid of the shaping, um, and then we can get rid of, we'll do a color by risk factor to minimize the number of colors. And then that will at least create a, a little less busy of a visual um, to work with. And then we'll move on to the links tab, where we have a lot of the same visuals. We've shown coloring by links, which you can click color, and it will allow you to color the links by the type. We can get rid of that as well. Um, there are a lot of other visuals here for links, so you can change the transparency. A lot of the times folks want to de-emphasize links uh, because any one link in any particular network may not necessarily be the most confident bit of information. And so many clusters um, that are rendered as posters or um, in, in publications, they tend to de-emphasize links. So you can uh, change that transparency setting. Uh, we also enable you to um, set the width by a particular um, visual or data characteristic. Um, you can change the length. As you see me drag the slider bar, this cluster here shown on screen gets larger and larger and larger. So um, in some cases, that's useful to really get an idea of how um, dense or how tight a particular region of the network is. You can see here everyone is connected to everyone. Um, and so you can't quite see that as well when the, when the links are all short. Um, and so that's one thing that you can do. You can see that we've layered on a, uh, a number for each link, which is the number of contacts between each pair. Um, and so what we can do is get rid of that as well uh, to get a more um, interpretable visual. Um, if you have information about the direction of naming or the direction of a particular link, for example, person A named person B as a contact, and the data that you've entered in is in that format, then you can layer on the arrows as well to show the naming. Um, and, and that really just depends on the format of the data that you have um, installed. So, or loaded. So if it's person A is connected to person B, it's going to be an arrow from person A to person B. 
Um, we have another tab that shows um, in visual information about the network. It also enables you to kind of customize the visual on screen. Um, so one thing um, in this network tab is the ability to highlight neighbors. So if I check this box and then highlight over a particular node, you can see that it shows only the neighbors of that node. Um, so that's one visual that is um, sometimes informative, especially when the network is very dense with a lot of links and you really kind of need to um, peer inside of a particular cluster, you can see exactly who is connected to who. We can turn that off and then open up the physics tab. The physics tab really enables you to customize the physics simulation where the nodes or the circles are pushing against each other. So here we have a charge slider bar. This indicates the charge that each uh, individual node it, um, uh, applies to everyone else. And so if the charge is low, they're not pushing hard against each other and it all kind of collapses. Uh, if the charge is high, they all push um, extra hard against each other. There's also a gravity feature that kind of keeps everything centered on screen. So we can change that slider bar that has mostly the same effect, but you can see that this um, has a stronger effect of packing individuals into the center versus packing individuals in and around um, the cluster that they're most tied to. Um, and so depending on what you would like to achieve on screen, um, you can play with these slider bars to get there. And then um, in addition to that, once you've kind of found the visual that you want, so let me take off node labels to find the visual that I want to export. Um, and now that I've um, done that, we can make slight customizations. And so in this little tray in the top left corner of the network window, there are a few options. One of them looks like a thumbtack that says pin all nodes. If you click that button, now every node is frozen in place and kind of freed from the physics simulation that we just described. Um, this will allow you so you can see that these two kind of look like they're overlapping so I could pull that individual out to the side um, and you can kind of visually inspect and see if there's any two that are overlapping that you'd like to drag um, a, a little bit separately um, to better emphasize a disconnection like here's a good example we might want to drag that off to the side. Um, but ultimately, once you've done that, um, you can um, then go up to the uh, top left corner and hit the download button. The download button will uh, take whatever is visually shown on screen and export that according to your specifications. So here I will export a test file. Um, we have a few different options. You can export it as PNG, JPEG, um, one of the more valuable ones is SVG or Scalable Vector Graphic. Um, this allows you to take the image and blow it up as large as you would like it to be. So if you've ever been to an academic conference where they have posters, most of those images, um, the way that they get blown up so large is that they're Scalable Vector Graphic or extremely high resolution. Um, and so you can export that um, in any of those file types. We do have the advanced option that will allow you to scale um, the resolution of that particular image. And then when you export, it will, um, assuming you have the settings set up properly in the browser, it will prompt you exactly where you'd like to put that file. Now it's important to note that by default, um, Google Chrome and most other browsers set a download directory and the files that you download go automatically to that download directory. You can actually specify um, in the application to say, hey, I'd like you to ask me every single time where you'd like this file to go. Um, and so I've done that here and told it um, to prompt me exactly where the file needs to go. And, and that's just good practice for uh, when you're working with very sensitive um, data. Um, and, and oftentimes you have very strict rules about where those data can exist. So here um, I'm going to save it to 
our desktop because it's a demo file. And we can take a look at what that image looks like. So we've got a little microbe trace logo in the top left corner. And, and you'll notice in our um, export menu, we do allow you to scale that watermark um, so that you don't have to, to see it as brightly as we have it there currently. Um, you can drag the opacity slider. You can make it larger or smaller, et cetera. Um, if you do get lost, if you're zoomed way in, you can press this button to, to reset that zoom and get everything on screen. The same goes if you're zoomed way out and you don't know where you are. You can press that button and it will redirect everything back um, on screen. And I'm just going to sh uh, show a lot of the other visual characteristics that we can um, look at, or visual views that we can look at these same data on. So um, one particular favorite of mine is the 3D network. Um, it's not entirely the most useful, but it certainly is flashy. Um, so here you can see that we've laid out the same network that we had in two dimensions, but now in three dimensions. Um, and in addition to that, it's also saved the color key that we set previously. And that's also in the top right. We can change that, and it'll automatically update. But um, if you right click and move your mouse, it will move the network up, down, left, right. Um, if you left click and move your mouse, it will spin the network around. And then if you want to zoom in or zoom out, you can use your uh, mouse scroll wheel. And that will allow you to kind of find these particular parts of the network where everyone's connected to everyone. And the particular value I find here is just really looking at these parts of the network. And you can see that clicking it or dragging a particular node causes the network to go a little jumpy as it continues to try and lay things out. But that's a fun visual to play with um, to really demonstrate the particular network that you're working with. Uh, so we can close that window. And one of the more useful pairs of, of visuals that we can work with is, is pairing the 2D network with a table. So I can pull up the 2D network. Um, and then I'm going to position these side by side. So I can grab the 2D network view. And it will um, reposition both of the network views side by side. Um, and then what I can do is tell it to recenter the visual. Um, and the nice thing is, in the table view, I can add some of the variables of interest, for example, age, and then sort by age and find some of the high age individuals. And you can start to see these guys being selected in the network. So this orange circle um, around the node indicates that it's been selected. And what I can do once I've selected them on the left side, on the right, you can drag one, and all the selected nodes will drag together. Um, and then that is useful for kind of pulling those apart. If you have the node, um, everything pinned in place, you can kind of drag them all together and have those ones out to the side. Um, or if you really want um, a visually obvious one, you can highlight by the number of neighbors and highlight. And by dragging these, you can see that I've dragged. Now we've got the same high age individuals as well as the high degree individuals selected. Um, and so that's one of the more useful visual um, combinations of, of uh, views. We have a variety of other views that are available. Um, so histogram is, is something that is often very difficult to achieve in, um, in Excel. So here you can see that we've now got kind of a 2D network view um, or characteristics on top. So what we can do is if you right click on the key, you can drag it. And this would allow you to kind of reposition it on screen. Or um, you can actually just hide it as well. And the same goes for this in the bottom right corner. And so now we'll set up the histogram visual. And so let's say I want to look at the histogram of the frequency of contact between individuals. So I can click on the variable. 
and look at the options. So for the link variables, the one I'm interested in is the number of, excuse me, the number of contacts between individuals. Um, and you can, once I've selected that, you can see that most everyone kind of falls in the one to three range, but there are some individuals that have uh, contact frequencies of four. Um, we can also look at things like node ages. And so this will give us a histogram of different age groups. Um, we could look at even counties so, or genders, for example. Um, in addition to um, the histograms, one of the more common uh, processes that we do in public health is just various levels of aggregation. Um, and so this visual uh, will put the aggregate view alongside the network and pull out the customization tab. So here, there's one cluster. And so aggregating on the variable cluster is really not all that informative. But what we could do is go down to risk factor. And you can immediately see that the, uh, the table gives you the frequency of each type of risk factor in the network, as well as the proportion of that particular group. Um, and this is all very rapidly calculated, so we can go and look at link level aggregations and look at the types of contacts that we just looked at in the histogram as well. And so this shows the frequency of number of types and types of contacts. And you can see there's that one person with four contacts where everyone else is in the one to three range. And if you had cluster level aggregates, you could look at those as well. Right here, we can show the average genetic distance or other types of, of variables if, if those were in um, the data set that we had connected. Um, just going down the list, there um, are a couple of other visuals that are very interesting here. One of them is the bubble view. We'll pull that alongside the network as well. And you can see that the selected nodes here on the left side um, are all still selected in the bubble view on the right. And you can kind of see where those individuals are with an orange um, border. Um, the bubble view can basically be colored according to a variable of interest. But in addition to that, um, you can um, position things or lay things out according to a variable. So we'll spread out the bubbles um, according to a risk factor. And you can see we've got the heterosexual grouped on the left, the injection drug users grouped um, next to that. And then we can also uh, break that out by another variable like zip code and look at how each of those particular zip codes break down by um, a, a given risk factor. Um, another diagram that is sometimes useful is the alluvial or flow diagram. Um, by default, it maps IDs to IDs, and then you can, can, um, you can visualize how different um, individuals connect at a node level or a link level. And so we'll start at the node level and consider how uh, risk factors link to the zip codes that we just looked at. And so here we can see each risk factor and grouped by, on the right side, which zip code um, they reported. Okay, in addition to that, you could add layers. Um, so you can add an additional layer that looks at, um, let's see, venue, which is like the venue at which an interview was conducted or the place uh, which they contacted a particular person. So you can look at associations between not just two variables, but, but more than that. So for one data set or one view, um, is really meant to show you all of the information that is in the network without actually showing you the network. So here we have a single cluster. Um, and so there's, there's uh, one cluster that we can click here on the left. Um, and then it has some brief information about that cluster. For example, there's 451 links. The average links per node is about 1.7. 
Um, and then within each cluster, it shows each individual. Um, and you can click on that individual and find all the information about that person. And then for each individual, once selected, it will show all of the links of that person. So I can click that link, and then it will show all the information associated with that link. All right, the last visual that I plan to show with this particular data set is layering on map or geographic information. So we can go up to the top left corner and hit view and go down to map. Um, and then this will immediately show us kind of a very low resolution map. Um, and this is what you'll see if you're working offline and disconnected from the internet. Um, and basically what you'll need to do is go into the gear menu, as with all the other menus, and select the highest level of geographic information that you have, or actually the lowest, highest resolution or the lowest level of geographic information. So if you want to put a point on a map, you need to have a latitude and longitude point. However, we realize that most people don't typically have those on hand or in their data set. In fact, it's more common that they have something like zip code or city or county in their data set. And so what you can do is select zip code here. And then um, currently what you'll need to do is go into the network tab under components and kind of toggle here going from show to hide to show all of the nodes on the map. Um, and you'll also see that the links are shown on the map as well. And um, it renders both of those on screen. But again, it's a very low resolution map. Uh, for those that are connected to the internet and have that available, you can scroll down to this online option and tell it that you'd like a higher resolution base map. As soon as you do that, um, you'll get a map that is uh, more commonly um, interpretable as just different, um, um, a, a high resolution map that you typically see with Google Maps. Um, we do enable you to um, layer on more information. So if you are an advanced user that works with GeoJSON files, you can uh, up load on custom GeoJSON files that will render those on top of the map that we have on screen. Um, there are a few other options like uh, color coding, et cetera. The jitter option um, will add a little bit of randomness to the nodes on screen and kind of move them from left to right, up or down a little bit to kind of spread things out when you have an over plotting problem. I'm not going to do that here. Um, in addition to that, there's kind of the standard link uh, color settings. Um, as well as transparency sliders. So if you want to look at level of link density between any two locations, um, you can get a hold of that with transparency. Um, and then there's also the ability to layer on more information between those links, again, on top of the map via a tooltip, which is a hover over option. Um, so here what we can do is map number of contacts. And you can see there's um, a hover a tooltip option. And then finally, the last section that I'm going to demonstrate with these data set, or with this data set, is the Gantt chart or the timeline, um, or visualizing timeline information in a Gantt chart format. Um, so you bring up the Gantt chart, and it is going to ask you to add dates. So um, most people have single dates in their data set. Um, so here we'll have the, the contact date or the date at which um, an interview is conducted. As soon as you select that date, it puts a little line down that corresponds to that date. And then you can change that color or the transparency. So here we'll make it blue. And you can play with the transparency up or down. Um, if you Ultimately, a Gantt chart is most commonly used in project management to look at the development of a particular project over time. But we found it useful to look at overlaps of period of time information. So for example, if person A was incarcerated at a location 
um, at the same time as person B, we could visually show that on the, on this Gantt chart map um, very easily where it would be difficult to see that by just looking at um, the dates in a spreadsheet format. In addition to that, in the tuberculosis realm, they have concepts of infectious and exposure periods that need to overlap for a potential transmission link to be real. So here we've created um, fake data that represents infectious and exposure periods. So I'm going to pick the start date of the infectious period and then the end date of the infectious period. And you can see that period is now rendered on screen as kind of a, a horizontal um, line. We can again change what that color looks like and we can add a, additional dates. So here we might want to layer on the exposure period, start and end, um, and then we'll leave that colored black. Um, so this allows you to get kind of a timeline view of a particular cluster or a particular outbreak um, and we do plan to build out and continue to um, build out functionality here. Uh, ideally, we would like you to be able to select a particular range um, and have that selection propagate um, back over to the 2D network so that you could say, I want to select all individuals from here to here and have that propagate over in the 2D network. Um, and so that's kind of a, an example of, of additional future roadmap of development. Okay, so we're going to continue using microbe trace to visualize um, sequence data. In the past, we've, in the other vi uh, videos, we've shown visualizing contact network and demographic data. This time we're going to focus specifically on the sequence data um, that arise from um, these types of investigations. So first I'm going to show you what those sequences look like. Um, so here we have um, a, a FASTA file where first on the first line you have the ID and then on the second line you have the actual character sequence of um, the genome that you're looking at. Um, and so that's the file type we're going to begin working with. So I will load the sequence file. It automatically determines that it's a FASTA file um, and then we can um, look at the alignment settings. We're not going to do any alignment for this particular file type, but I just want to dive in and explain the intricacies around aligning a file, whether you need to, um, if your file is already aligned, like you've already used it for another phylogenetic tree, or um, you've, you've used those sequence files previously for some other project, um, they're most likely already aligned. Uh, a common tool that's used to do that is called Mega. Um, that's usually um, easily accessible and free on Windows. Um, but if you have not aligned your sequences, um, you can click the alignment settings and it's going to bring up this, this pop-up window. It gives you a brief preview of what your alignment looks like. And you can see pretty well that these sequences are all very lined up. So all the little colors that you see on screen represent um, A's, T's, G's, and C's. And so you can see kind of vertical lines representing similarity from sequence to sequence. Um, if it doesn't look nice and aligned like you see here, then you likely do need to align the sequences, in which case you would click Smith Waterman here. Um, and then you can um, specify some of the specifics of the algorithm. You really don't need to, to do any of that. Um, ideally, you would just scroll down and hit confirm. Um, if you do, if you are working with a different pathogen than HIV, you will need to use a different reference sequence to align the sequences to. By default, we align it to the polymerase region of the HXB2 reference sequence. And this is a subtype B HIV sequence that was first isolated in the early 1980s. Um, and it's widely commonly used simply because it's um, a good example of the subtype B uh, virus that represents about 95% of cases in the United States. Um, if you have a different region of the HIV genome or a different bug in particular, say TB or hepatitis C, then what you would do is pick the, uh, a reference 
sequence that you're interested in, and that's got to be saved as a separate file for you to access it here. Um, as I mentioned, we're not going to align since this sequence uh, data set is uh, currently aligned. Um, and then we will jump in and visualize it. So as soon as you hit launch, it aligns all the sequences and compares genetic distances between each of those sequences and then renders the visual on screen. Um, and so we'll move things around to kind of get our bearings. We see a few tight clusters, a few um, smaller ones where there's only two, three, and four individuals. Um, but ultimately, we're most interested in this large cluster here. Um, if we want to visualize these data in other ways, so the, we'll co cover the sequence-oriented alignment uh, or sequence oriented views. So first if you want to take a look at your sequences just as in the previous view uh, where we gave you a brief preview here is actually all of the sequences lined up so that you can actually investigate and see where all the differences are, where there might be improper alignments, where things are off kilter a little bit. Um, but this just kind of gives you a quick view of all of your sequences. Um, we also will show a heat map view, which will show the genetic distances um, that we're interested in um, as a heat map. So each uh, row and each column represents an individual, and then the box, uh, the colored box, represents the genetic distances between those two individuals at that row and that column. Um, and so you can see if you hover over each little square, it shows you sequence A, sequence B, and then the distance between those two sequences. So this is just another way of viewing the same type of data. Um, and then finally, probably the more commonly used um, visual is a phylogenetic tree. So this will represent all of um, the nodes um, on a phylogenetic tree according to their distances. Um, so I'm going to briefly cover some of the um, ways in which we can customize this visual. Um, layouts are usually the most common, commonly changed thing. So we start by default with a weighted dendrogram that's based on the genetic distances that we've calculated. But you can also look at it as just a tree where each split represents a generation and the, the bar at the bottom just kind of counts how many parents along that tree all the way back to uh, the beginning. Um, we've seen the weighted dendrogram. There's also the unweighted dendrogram, which will force it to align all the individuals um, according to the ID at the far right. Um, and then we can also switch the different layouts. So right now we've been looking at a horizontal one, but the circular layout is a much more common um, way to look at large numbers of sequences, especially when you reach into the hundreds and the thousands. Um, again, here um, it, it renders on screen the distances at each um, individual, distances between them, and then distances along the paths of each branch. Um, there are a lot of other visuals, as you can see, that you know, specify like what the corners look like, if they're straight or rounded, or what the label sizes are, um, similar to a lot of the other visuals um, that you're used to. So here you can see the label sizes changing, where they go, um, etc. So those are kind of the high level visuals um, that you can access um, to visualize sequence data um, in microbe trace. All right, so continuing on with, with uh, visualizing sequence data, one common operation is we'd like to look at genetic clusters using different genetic distance thresholds. Um, and so what we can do is go to the settings menu in the top left and immediately under the filtering tab in this global settings, which you can drag over to the side um, so that you can see what you would like to view on screen. Um, <clears throat> it will show you a kind of a quick hit, uh, histogram of all the distances. You can see 
that there's a little bar plotted for each genetic distance. Um, there is a drop down, so you can actually filter the network according to different numeric characteristics. We aren't going to show that here other than applying it to the genetic distance characteristic. Um, and so what we can do is slowly tick down the genetic distance and you'll begin to start to see this network fragment as we tick down. Um, and so you'll start to see as we lower the genetic distance threshold, these very tightly wound clusters where everyone's connected to everyone um, begin to fall apart and fragment. Um, the downside to that is that you've now lowered the th genetic distance threshold to really a, a single mutation and you no longer remember the people that were connected at say two or three mutations. So one uh, capability that we've developed is to be able to take the network that you see on screen and look at the nearest neighbor of each node. So each individual has mathematically a nearest neighbor. Um, and if you can have more than one person that has that same nearest neighbor value, so if I'm one step away from one person and one step away from another person, both of those individuals are my nearest neighbors. Um, but someone that's two steps away is not, right? So um, what we can do is apply this nearest neighbor filter and immediately everyone that was connected is still connected, but we're now showing just the closest links of each individual. And again, it's not just only the closest. You know, if we have two zero distance links, it only shows the first one because you can see in this square each of these individuals has three nearest neighbors that are all the same distance value. Um, and so where there is, um, uh, where you are unsure about a connection because they're all equidistant, we make sure to render all of, all of that on screen so that you can see all of those possible connections. So we're going to continue visualizing sequence data, but in, in this instance, we're going to take the sequence file that we started with previously, and we're going to layer on an additional list of links between those individuals or, or members with, with those sequences. So here I'm going to take the example sequences file, which again is just a FASTA file with A's, T's, G's, and C's. And then I'm going to layer on another list of connections between person A and person B uh, with some kind of distance. And then we will relaunch that visual. And what we see here is that in situations where there are links appearing in both, uh, in both data files, um, then each link will be colored with both links or with both colors. So we have it as light blue and dark blue when a, uh, a link appears in more than one data file. Um, but let's look at the connections between all of these links and uh, the more distant links that we've built into the file as well. The way that we'll do that is first pin all individuals um, on screen so that they don't move. You can see what that looks like. They're not going to fly around on screen. And then we'll go into the settings menu and apply a filter. But in this case, we'll increase that filter to show the other links at higher genetic distances between these different clusters. So initially what we're showing are um, close genetic links uh, between these individuals. And then um, we layer on a, a, an additional layer and you can see um, how everything kind of still connects to one another. Um, I'll unpin these things and it will all kind of coalesce back together and you can see that there's kind of one large cluster um, and another smaller one next to it. We'll continue that process of increasing the filter and eventually what you'll begin to see is that there are some links that do not appear in both data sets. There are some links like these ones right here that are all a single color showing a, a genetic distance but not uh, showing as coming from a separate file. 
And so this will allow you to kind of see different networks. And, and the use case that we envision you using this for is sequence data from one outbreak, contact tracing from the same outbreak, and then maybe additional um, sequence data from a different pathogen. So you can measure the genetic distances between hepatitis viruses and layer on the HIV network, the hepatitis network, with an additional layer of the contact tracing network. And then that would actually show you where, wherever there is agreement between each of those three layers, you will see the color of the link alternating the three different colors. All right, and that concludes the, the visualization um, demonstration aspect of our microbe trace webinar. We do want to uh, finish with a few closing words of the road ahead um, and generally uh, support how you might find support from us. Um, so I, I want to go back to the start and remind you that user feedback really reigns supreme here. Many of the visuals that we've demonstrated have been directly requested by um, state and local users of this system as they uh, dive into public health investigations and outbreaks. Um, and so we have built um, this tool in the public and open source um, on GitHub. Um, and, it, um, and, and as well as it's located on code.gov or referenced on code.gov as well. Um, and we allow you to support or submit feedback issues through GitHub. So on our GitHub page, um, you can see um, the issue tracker, which is just a color-coded list of things that we'd like to develop. Many of those issues have actually been submitted by users. Um, if you do have a user request, please go there and, and submit one, and we can um, update you and, and keep track of it and um, you'll be notified when um, progress is made on that particular issue. Um, if you have any particular one-off support questions or if you'd like to set up a one-on-one -on -one webinar uh, for you and your, your team or a one-on-many webinar for you and your team, um, please feel free to reach out to us at uh, microbetrace at cdc.gov for any one-off support questions or to set up um, additional um, training situations. As we've mentioned throughout, there are a lot of other use cases for microbe trace. Um, there, while it is actively being used for HIV transmission clusters and outbreak response, um, there are a lot of other use cases for it in tuberculosis as well as hepatitis C. Um, and we are also beginning to work with uh, foodborne outbreak groups to visualize their uh, contact data and genetic information as well. Um, and so with that, I just want to uh, close and, and acknowledge that this is really um, work that's being done by a very small but dedicated team um, here in the laboratory branch of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. Um, and um, thank you.